how many of you interact with artificial intelligence every day? Okay, that's pretty good. You know, it's almost all of you, and really, we all do, right? Because it is here. It's part of Google. It's part, if you have a, a, a car, chances are there's an artificial intelligence system in it, you know, to power the braking, or if you have a Tesla, um, Netflix recommendations, all those things are powered by artificial intelligence. And one of the things that we kind of don't think about is we've heard AI is coming, AI is coming, AI is coming, but really, it arrived just not in the way that we expected it to arrive. So we expected it to arrive with a big cataclysmic change, and it's really more like death by a thousand paper cuts, or life by a thousand paper cuts, whatever you want to uh, say, uh, because AI is here, and it really is starting to be a part of almost everything that we do, certainly as marketers and uh, communicators, journalists, creators, AI is a part of everything. One of the challenges is we often confuse what AI is and does. There are actually three different types of AI. The first one is narrow AI. Second one, artificial general intelligence. And the third one is super intelligence, artificial super intelligence. Um, and Artificial narrow intelligence is what we have right now. It's single purpose, so it's really great at doing one thing. And an example of artificial narrow intelligence is Google Duplex. How many of you have seen the Google Duplex conversational voice search demo? Just a couple of people. If you have, and if we have time, we'll play it at the end, but if not, just search Google Duplex. It is a digital assistant that can call and make reservations at restaurants or book hair appointments, and it sounds human. I mean, it really does. In fact, people couldn't tell the difference uh, between what it was, uh, you know, that it was a machine, and Google had to transparently say that it was a machine. But it sounds human, complete with the ums and ahs that we have. Uh, Self-driving cars, those are single purpose. Digital voice assistants are, are, are single purpose. And really, Sophia the robot, who some of you have seen, is single purpose. It's not sentient. Um, when we get into artificial general intelligence, that's when the AI can transfer knowledge between tasks, similar to what we do. And, and artificial general intelligence is what we see on TV a lot, in shows like Westworld or in movies like her. Um, artificial super intelligence, that's when things get really interesting or crazy or dangerous or scary because the AI is smarter than humans collectively are or ever will be. Will it become conscious as in the singularity? Maybe, maybe not. All I know is don't trust anyone named Hal. <laughs> <laughs> so AI isn't a new phenomenon. It, it, uh, it actually started with Alan Turing, who was somebody who was a uh, uh, professor of uh, well, actually, he was a mathematician and computer scientist, one of the first, actually, uh, and uh, is better known for having cracked the Enigma machine uh, during World War II. And unfortunately, he, he met a, a terrible end uh, because of um, you know rampant homophobia and other things at the time. Uh, but the thing with uh, Alan Turing is he, he came up with the concept that a machine can be intelligent by representing its intelligence to someone else, right? So uh, the way we can test for intelligence in a machine is whether it can trick us into making us think that it's intelligent. So, you know, if you, um, so, so his theory was representational, right? After that, uh, we started to have the real birth of AI in the 50s, and we had uh, Turing, and uh, McCarthy, uh, McCarthy, John McCarthy, the professor, and uh, was really one of the first people to start serious research into what, into how to build uh, computers that think. Uh, and those computers were thinking in in really primitive and, and, and uh, rudimentary ways at the beginning, right? Uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, you started to see the, the, the advent of neural networks, which we, we now hear about a lot, right? Which are uh, way, which are, um, theories of AI or models of AI that are loosely based on how, how we think the brain processes information, so the way neurons talk to each other. Uh, but because of a lack of enormous amounts of data and because of a lack of, of funding, uh, the 90s, the 80s, and the, the late part of the second part of the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s, the early 2000s, became what's called like an AI winter, 
right? It was a term that was coined in 1984 to, to denote a time when, when actually uh, funding had dried up, interest had dried up, and it was mostly because it was too expensive and there wasn't enough data. Um, in the 2010s, we've seen the resurgence now and a new golden age of AI. And the real reason for that is that all of a sudden, we have uh, people who work in, their, in artificial intelligence have access to enormous amounts of data, mostly because our lives are becoming digital, right? Yeah, and a lot of the neural nets that were popularized in the 70s and 80s, that's what's being used now. So Jeffrey Hinton, who is a prof at uh, U of T, he was really well known for uh, some of the breakthroughs in neural nets. He's been working on it for years and really being laughed at by a lot of his colleagues up until recently. Um, and he was one of the co-winners of the Turing Prize this past year. That's right. Um, in the 50s, you probably remember this toy, or you remember this toy anyway that was invented in the 50s, Magic 8-Ball. The Magic 8-Ball is really a good metaphor for AI, because what do you do? You ask it a question, and it makes a prediction about um, what is going to happen. And sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, but its predictions don't get better, um, regardless of how many times you know, we'll ask it a question, or how many times it answers correctly. It's artificial, but it isn't intelligent. So, as Martin just suggested, uh, it, to, to make a machine, to have a, an intelligent magic eight ball, the magic eight ball has to have some sort of thinking process behind it. And for it to learn, for that algorithm or that thinking process to work, it needs experience, it needs data. And so what uh, has happened over the last 10 years is there's, there's been this enormous expansion of the, the digital parts of our lives, as I mentioned earlier. So you know everything from, from interactions via social media, to email, to uh, automated telephone systems, to text messaging, uh, that's on the communication side, to smart homes in our everyday lives, right? To, to homes in which appliances communicate with one another, right? And to, to things like smartwatches, wearables, right? Which are, are, are you know, currently really making a huge impact on our lives as well as the fashion industry, right? And communications. So wearables are really the, the, the next step. I mean, it's interesting. I have kind of a, a neat story. Like I've, I've got a smartwatch here, which is kind of when I pretend to, to run and, and get fit. Uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, it, but it has a neat feature. And the feature is that it, it measures your stress. I think it's a Garmin, although I'm not, in, not endorsing them. <laughs> you know. and, and so it, blue bars means you're not stressed. Amber bars means you're stressed. Right? So this changed my life. <laughs> because all of a sudden, I started paying attention to whether I was stressed or not. And I found it was pretty accurate. Because when I, when I felt stressed, it, I, I would get amber bars. So um, I started look, talking to people and then checking my watch afterwards <laughs> and going, hmm, <laughs> am I going to minimize my time with you or am I going to maximize, right? <laughs> Depending on how stressful they were. Uh, but more impactfully on my life, it taught me what actually makes me relax. I used to think that watching movies or, or being engaged with, uh, with uh, podcasts or audiobooks, that kind of thing, was relaxing because I'm a little bit nerdy. Uh, but uh, what I found out was that that actually did not relax me. It aroused me. It excited me, right? What, rather, what relaxed me was, was uh, walking in the forest, um, reading like a paper book, uh, and, uh, and, and other things like that. So that affected my life because the next, when I had to move uh, four years ago, it actually impacted the way I, where I chose to live. So I wanted to live near a trail so that when I need to, to chill out, I, I just go and walk in the forest. So data is everywhere. And we create the data, but then the data shapes us too. Right? So this year, in general, the world will generate about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. That's a billion plus six zeros. Right? So that's, that's a lot. And that's you know, a number that's increasing. Um, well, for a while, it was increasing geometrically. So it's increasing really, really, really fast. Right? And as everybody moves towards having smarter and smarter homes and more wearables and other pieces of technology in their lives, um, that number will, will increase drastically. So that means that data, we're, we're awash in an ocean of data. Right? So there are three types of data that concern us. And this is where it starts to get interesting and practical. Um, as marketers, advertisers, people that work in PR, my background's PR and, and, and marketing, um, the, uh, 
we generate a lot of data through our campaigns, whether you're doing internal comms or external, whether you're, whether you're running a, you know, a digital advertising campaign and, and that it, that's interactive where you seek feedback from, from potential customers or whatever, right? And so the three types of data that are generated are structured or unstructured or semi-structured. And it's, it's actually, a, I teach a course in data science in, the, in our communications, masters, uh, uh, communications management master's degree. And, and these are kind of some fundamental things that are useful for marketers and communicators to know. So structured data are the data that people, that com computers really easily understand. So if you have a spreadsheet and in one column you have months of the year, and on the other ones you have how much, how much money you've spent on a campaign, for example. So like January, $550, February, $600. That's structured data. The computer can understand that very, very easily because it's fully defined. On the opposite end of the spectrum is unstructured data. And that's human communication in general, right? So a good example that I like to use is when you, when you uh, speak, so when you know, we have conversations with each other, we think we're talking about important, serious things and that we're, we're being so eloquent and so articulate. But if you were to take what your interactions with your friends, even like what you think to be like an intelligent, smart interaction, and transcribe it, write it down, and then read it half an hour later, you'll be shocked at how incoherent it is, right? Because our spoken, en spoken English, or French, French is my first language, uh, is, uh, or any language, right, is by its very nature ambiguous. It's full of stops and starts. We finish each other's sentences. We uh, are, understand context from one another. So it's language is unstructured. Visual art, unstructured as well. It, it requires so much interpretation on the part of, and intuition on the part of the, the viewer, right? Uh, music can be that way too. Semi-structured is, is somewhere in the middle. So most of the data that, that a campaign will generate is semi-structured, right? So think of an email. An email has a structured component at the top, all the meta, so who, who's it from, who's it going to, that kind of stuff, what the subject line was. But then the body of the, of the email is unstructured, right? So you have a structured part, and then the body is unstructured because you're writing away. And there's a, more, there's a growing tendency towards in, uh, not being formal to, in, in, uh, in, our in our typed communication, our written communication. So most of what we, you get back is, is semi-structured. Same with tweets. Tweets are semi-structured because you know who it's coming from, you know who, who, uh, you know who it was aimed at. Same with... Um, you know, comments on, on Facebook pages or, or, or other things. Um, Alex was talking just a second ago about uh, unstructured data. So one of the ways computers understand the meaning and uh, the context of words is through natural language processing. And I don't know, how many of you have read about GPT-2? So OpenAI, which is uh, a research company based in Silicon Valley, they developed um, an algorithm called GPT-2, which really writes conversationally, and it's getting a lot better. In fact, they were a little scared about the potential for this uh, algorithm to become, uh, or this model, to become a fake news generator, that they released it in stages. They just released the whole one. Um, and really, AI are getting very good at writing. A couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the New Yorker, long article, where the author had G GPT-2 end each section. And honestly, sometimes the words were a bit jumbled, but it had the New Yorker tone down to a T. So what we want to do is just take a second and show you GPT in action. OK. So just like in improv, we need a name, a place, and a thing. But the name has to have uh, first name and last name. So anybody name, first name, last name? Can be your own? See, no, that's not a name. That's like, I mean a person's name. Elba, okay. So. So now a place and a thing. Place, and See and Tara, okay. <laughs> How about that? Now let's see what GP2 thinks is going to happen next. 
Uh, Elle Bul Bulger went to dinner at the CN Tower at a restaurant called La Belle Vie. Her companion was her lawyer, David Sullivan, and her attorney's partner was Michael Krasny. The last day of Leanne, now here's where it starts getting ridiculous, right? But it's, it's getting a lot better. And if you think about what we're doing as marketers, um, this kind of writing, when it gets better, will turn out hundreds of ideas for posts, for content, and then we can sift through and hopefully edit it. Yeah, it's a little dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, you know what? It, it, it's kind of funny and dark, and you never know what you're going to get. Type into something like that, uh, you know, Donald Trump uh, goes to Mars, and it's really crazy what comes out of it. So um, computer vision is another side of, of, of AI that's, that's really a valuable and useful. And uh, I actually implemented one of this for one of my clients outside the university, where they had a, uh, multiple Facebook pages, right, across which they seeded, they seeded content, right? And uh, they, a lot of the content they seeded was shareable content, right? So, so uh, banners or ads or, or, or little uh, vignettes or whatever, right? Uh, GIFs, et cetera, right? So uh, we wanted to understand how this works. Uh, and we wanted to understand how uh, those things were propagating. But it was really hard to find, to get metrics on, to get analytics, because there, there were no hashtags. There were no, no, no ways of, of doing a word search across all those pages that we had permissions on, right, uh, to, 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 to search for and find, find how many times those, those things were being added. Plus, individual pages were using different language. So we had to find a way to actually search for the images themselves, right? So I'll give, before I tell you what we did, I'll just show you what Tesla does. So I, I uh, yeah, go for it. So, so this is what you're, if, if you drive a Tesla or you're, or you're being driven by a Tesla, uh, which is more the case these days, um, this is what your car sees, right? And, and so what it is, it's, it's identifying objects, right? And it's giving them a label. Right? The way it was trained was, was through many, many thousands of humans um, clicking and, and identifying things. Right? Um, and, that's, and then after a while, it got good enough that it could, it could do it itself. Right? So that's how Tesla works. What we did in our situation, which is, more, which is closer to a, to a marketing situation, was that we, uh, we pulled a, an image recognizer off GitHub, uh, which is a very, uh, GitHub is a, a source for all sorts of uh, uh, code, programming code, uh, if, you, if you need it. And we built our own image analyzer that would actually identify our shareables and then track them across our pages because they, they each have a digital signature, right? And so we, were, we didn't have to do text search. We could, we could search for the pictures, videos, or GIFs themselves, right? So it was a super useful tool. That, that, that we developed, and it was uh, um, the marketing team teams were were were, were jazzed because they, they could now talk about and get data on specifically which ones are being uh, which shareables are being shared best, and then we eventually built a predictive model, right? So we we were able to predict which ones would do best, because we eventually after thousands upon thousands of these were shared, we we're able to to have enough data. To predict, oh, if you use one, if you use a, an image with somebody with a person's face with a yellow background, for example, le higher likelihood that it'll be shared in that particular data set. Um, really, when you think about the way machines learn, they learn a lot. The, uh, they learn in a very similar way to the way children learn through experience. Except for machines, their experience is multi-sensory data, and really, the, the secret to machine learning and AI is very, very simple. It's just more data you have, the better statistical predictions you get. How many of you are good at statistics? If not, LinkedIn Learning has a really good course on them, and it's something as marketers and communicators we should all take. And that gives us better results. It really is just a matter of predictions and, and based on an algorithm. And just to add to that, uh, it, one of the things you can do as a marketer or communicator or advertising, a person working in advertising, is uh, you can. Uh, know the types of data you're generating, right? Because if you want to be able to capture what your campaign is doing and the impact it's having, you should know what your campaign is producing that can be measured, right? If you don't know yourself, somebody else is imposing their definition of your job on you, 
right? And so you don't have to be a data scientist or, or a computer programmer to actually just understand we're using JPEGs, we're using MPEGs, we're using, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, um, we're generating uh, comma-separated value files, whatever, right? Um, Algorithms, and algorithms are really, it's, we bandy the word around, but not a lot of people know what it means. It's pretty simple. It's like a, it's a formalized process, right? So an algorithm is just a, a sequence of events that are captured in logic, and this is a, a really neat one um, put up by Karen Howe from MIT Technology Magazine. And um, what uh, an algorithm does is, it, like a recipe, it tells you the specific steps and precise steps to get you from point A to an outcome, to point, to, to point B. And that's all an algorithm is, right? So we want to show an example of AI in action with something we do every day, and that is search on Google. What I'm going to do, if you have Chrome, you can try this at home, because uh, Google uses semantic search. Semantic search understands a relationship between words. So it knows that if you search for Alex Semi, for example, you're probably searching for a person, um, as opposed to Boolean search, which had you know pluses and minuses, you know, and uh, and ors. Um, so let's ask it: Who is the Prime Minister of Canada? Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada. Is anyone surprised? No. <laughs> now let's ask a second question: Who is he married to? Not who is Justin Trudeau married to, but who is he married to? Who is he married to? He's been married to Sophie Gregoire Trudeau since 2005. How many children do they have? Okay, so I wrecked it, but this goes on and on. <laughs> uh, you can see how many children, you can see who his father was, because Google really understands what we're doing. And now they've recently released an algorithm called BERT, which stands for Bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, which means it, it basically means that it takes your input and it gives you an input back. Yeah, so it goes way beyond keywords. So, for example, if there's a restaurant that sells coffee and it's nearby, but they don't have the word espresso on their site, and I search this, uh, I want an espresso near me, that restaurant will probably show up because Google understands the synonym. And so it will reshape the way that uh, we as marketers approach search and SEO and the kind of content we create because we have to start thinking um, not only in keywords but also in synonyms. So, so bias is a, is a major ethical concern with, with artificial intelligence. And it might, to a lot of people, it sounds counterintuitive because they think, oh, well, it's a computer. How could it be biased? Right? But the fact is, Again, we've been talking for the last 25 minutes about how uh, the data is everything, right? So how, what you train the data, the, the, your AI on, the, whatever data set it is, those assumptions and those prejudices and those um, uh, will shape the inferences that it makes, will shape the output. So for example, you've heard, you've heard stories about, um, about uh, you know, in the, in the southern United States, there were, there were um, uh, the judicial system was using, of, of one or two states were, were using, uh, AI to help uh, sentence prisoners, right? Uh, and uh, it, it had a, an inherent racial bias because of the racial bias in, in, in the data set, which was all of the decisions up to that point, right? So it, it just reproduced that bias. So, you know, that's a big kind of, you know, that's a big political example. But, but if you look at uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, it's, it's key, especially if you're going to use something that, that generates responses, an interactive AI, like uh, a chatbot or something like that, uh, making sure that it isn't offending your customers or, or coming out with, with um, you know, particularly if you're running an advertising campaign that has an interactive component, right? You want to make sure that anything you've trained it on is, is going to represent the audience that you want to reach. So if, if you're interested in reaching, you know, uh, women aged, 25 to 45, um, living in a certain place, you should, tr you, sh you should make sure that whoever is building that for you, right, your chatbot or whatever it is that you're going to use in your campaign, make sure that they're training it on data that come from women that age from that area, right? So that it captures all the idios idiosyncrasies of their speech and, and priorities. 
Yeah, and it's harder to get than you think because so many algorithms are written by people with very similar backgrounds, white guys who've been educated, you know, at the same universities in the U.S. pretty much. And so those biases that are in their minds just naturally show up in the algorithms. And that's why Amazon had a hiring algorithm that was naturally just screening out women. And so they had to stop using it because they realized they were losing uh, half of you know the potentially great applicants that they could get because of the way the algorithm was written to favor uh, the way men wrote their resumes. Um, right now, probably the 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 one thing we're we're interacting with all the time are chatbots, especially on websites. You know, you go on a, on a website, something pops up. If you go to Rogers and you have a question, it's a bot generally that answers you. And Rogers is not bad at knowing when to switch you to a human being. But it answers. You know, if you say, "Are you a chatbot?" Yes, I'm. A, you know, it tells you that. And we're starting to trust chatbots a lot more. And it, it, interesting because um, the research I did for my master's thesis that I worked on with Alex, is called, it's called My BFF is a Chatbot. And what I did was explore the relationship between human and humans and AI agents and how that affects communications and trust. One of the things that I found was that we tend as people to trust other people when it comes to opinion, but when it comes to matters of fact, or information we trust machines. And if you think about you're driving in your car, you've got directions from Google Maps or Waze, your passenger says, I know a better way, who are you gonna trust? You know, <laughs> Waze or Google or your passenger. And, and that all depends on different things. Um, anybody know who that is? Yeah, Salvador Dali. So Salvador Dali died 30 years ago? Okay. He, ha he hasn't really died yet, and I'll show you in a second. Um, we hear a lot about deep fake videos. And deep fake videos are created by something called a generative adversarial network, or GAN, and that's just a term you should know and, and get familiar with. What is a GAN? A GAN is simply the spy versus spy of the algorithm world, just like Mad Magazine. So you have two algorithms trained on the same data set, and one of them keeps trying to trick the other one, and as soon as it tricks the other one, then it produces a fake that is believable, and that's a deep fake. So we have deep fake videos. We also have something called deep faces, which are photos of people who don't exist. There's actually, uh, a stock photo site that is being launched where you'll be able to buy photos of people who don't exist, who look like people, um, and that you can use in your campaigns. You need to ask yourself the ethics around that. Um, deep fake, I know, pretty surprising, isn't it? Deep fake videos, we think of them as all bad. And there's a lot of negative associated with them, certainly around politicians, you think, you know, all the, um, tampering that could be done in an election, but really what researchers are worried about is deep fake videos could be used as revenge porn, really to get back as people. They could be used in a divorce custody case where one of the spouses wants to make it seem like the other spouse was really irresponsible. So that, that's what we have to watch. But it's not all bad. They can be used for good. And I want to show you um, what Salvador Dali thinks about deep fake videos. to do is you got to uh, take a selfie with him. Yeah, he says, do you want to take a selfie? And that's me 
and my new BFF, Salvador <laughs> Dali, from this past summer. The other thing they do at that museum is they integrate augmented reality um, with his paintings. Um, and you can go into a studio, download an app, hold it up in front of one of his paintings, and get these incredible um, pieces of information, parts come to life. You can use virtual reality and walk inside a Dali painting, which is in itself a surreal experience. So we need to think about all these things. You know, there's a lot of negative about AI, but there are also some positive things. So we, we have to just make sure that whatever we do, we consider the consequences. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the consequences is workplace of Hebel. And we thought we'd put this slide up because it's reassuring to creative professionals, right? Um, if you think of the, the, the jobs that, that are likely to be automated, and if you, you can go and look there, if you just search, uh, will my job be automated on Google, uh, you'll, get, you'll get lots of uh, uh, sites that will, will predict whether or not your job will be automated. Um, and the ones that are least likely to be automated, interestingly, are, are those in the arts or creative uh, creatives in general, right? Um, public relations, um, marketing communications, uh, advertising. Why? Because it requires human intuition and context and creativity and AI just isn't there yet, right? The ones that are most likely to be automated are, are things in computer science, bookkeeping, accounting, law, uh, and, and, and other areas in which it's, it's highly predictable, formal processes that are repeated over and over again, right? So we kind of wanted to end on, the, on, a, on a, note, a practical, useful note for you guys. And, and uh, the thought is this. One of the things that I do when I teach this course at Mac uh, and that uh, I do when I work with clients is you don't, I tell people, because everybody, everybody hears about AI and data science and data, and they start losing their minds, right? They start saying, I can't do that. I'm, I, I don't even know how to add. <laughs> <laughs> right or, or or whatever right or, or I, I don't don't talk to me about using Excel and this kind of thing right and that's actually one of the things that I tell people that I work with at the university and outside is that you don't really have to but what you should do is build relationships with people who do right so it's it's key to know how to work with with data scientists so if you're if you're in an organization that's fairly large or lar you know a, a corporation or a government office or uh, even a larger a large agency right chances are you have uh, you have, might have an institutional research team, you might have uh, an archivist, you might have a data science and IT team, right, if it hasn't been outsourced. And if you are, um, if you do have those people around, right, that's great. Make, make friends with them, right? Why? Because eventually, the C-suite and whoever, who, whoever else is, is going to be evaluating your creative output as a creative professional is going to want it to be quantified, right? They're going to want to know was your campaign effective, right? They're gonna to wanna to know whether you've reached a number of people, whether you've enhanced the brand and reputation of the organization you're working for, right? And um, that isn't clear how you're gonna do that, right? And, and the IT people, if you leave it to the IT people and the data science people in your organization to define the key metrics and the key performance indicators and milestones that your team doing your creative work should be meeting, meeting that's a self-defeating prophecy. <laughs> Right? So really, the people that know your work best in, in, in organizations where you're doing creative work is you, right? You, uh, and so it's important that you work with the people that are gonna design metrics, analytics, KPIs, so that they actually capture the value that you're adding in the organization. They actually capture the relationships that you're building. You add, they actually capture the awareness of the brand, right? Or the strength of the, of the affinity community that you're building. And I can guarantee you that if you just leave it to the IT people to figure it out for you, it won't represent what you actually do. So, it's, so think like a data scientist. You don't have to be one. Think like one. Think about the things that actually define your campaign. Think about the things that actually define your practice as a creative professional. And then think about ways that measuring them makes sense. And this is actually one of the things that I think Martin and I do most these days with, 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 with uh, people outside, uh, well, in, in that sort of client space. Yeah, and what it means is it's incumbent on all of us to educate ourselves on some of the terminology. So to know what narrow AI is, to know what a GAN is, so that when we see those terms, we know how to ask 
the right questions, because that's a key thing. And building relationships with the people who want to help us. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. We also want to leave you with a number of resources that you can check out if you'd like to uh, just read more about uh, AI. Human plus machine, it's kind of boring. But don't quote me on that. Don't tweet that, please. <laughs> but there's a great section in the middle on the human uh, AI or human machine collaboration. The Big Nine, amazing book by Amy Webb, talking about um, the Big Nine companies who are responsible for the AI research. And they are the G Mafia, which is a great term, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, uh, IBM, and Apple, and BAT, uh, which is uh, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent in China. And they, they're the ones who are controlling the research and controlling the dollars. And some of the scenarios that she paints are pretty horrifying. So we need to, again, educate ourselves. Um, AI for Marketers by Christopher Penn, fantastic book, because it, it gives you case studies and things you can do right now. And if you really want to get scared and read about AI philosophically, Nick Bostrom, who's a prof at Oxford, his book, Super Intelligence, goes into some frightening scenarios. It's a long read, but it's well, well worth it. Thank you.